Welcome everyone to uh, our uh, research highlight stream. Um, it's, it's been a while since we've had some kind of research focused uh, live stream here uh, at the Wolfram Institute. But of course, if you uh, saw our, our last stream, which was basically a we're back into action live stream, uh, we're, we're excited to get back into a rhythm of, of new forms of live streaming and hopefully a re regular schedule uh, come September. So uh, today I'm going to be essentially uh, emceeing this session as uh, I'm very happy to uh, report that uh, paper by myself and Bernard Rivolowicz here in, in the call as well has been published and this was research that is not directly uh, pertaining to, to the research that I was, uh, was working on at the Institute but it was uh, connected to the rewriting, hypergraph rewriting uh, that I've been working on. Uh, pretty much uh, since I joined the Institute. So uh, today I wanted to have a, a sort of relatively informal presentation of the topic and uh, why uh, this uh, new species of ternary algebras uh, that we've called die heaps are relevant. And uh, I mean, if Jonathan, uh, who's uh, meant to be here, joins us uh, later on, uh, we'll probably have more of a brainstorming sort of a general uh, question um, uh, open questions sort of session um, but uh, let me just um, you know introduce uh, the people here so obviously you have Richard and Nick that you most people will will know so hello Richard hello Nick welcome to the stream and we have uh, Bernard who is uh, my co-author he's a, a postdoc at Harriet Watt University in, in Edinburgh and uh, I was I had the pleasure of uh, collaborating with him last year when I was still there so, hello Bernard, welcome. All right, so um, just to uh, uh, remember, to remind everyone that we are gonna, we're gonna have a sort of presentation part of the live stream, which should probably take about half an hour of me telling you about this, uh, this uh, ternary beings, uh, the ternary algebras. And after that, the idea is that we should have some open questions. and. Uh, and open discussion. So uh, if you have questions, do post them on the chat. Remember that you can always join the Wolfram Institute communities. I'm going to share the link in the chats in a second. So you should see um, the links right now. And um, just bear in mind, if you want to interact with, with us, the, the fellows, with other community members, that's where you, that's where you find us. Um, and uh, you know, if you have more detailed questions and you want to follow up on anything that is being discussed today, you can find us over there. Um, okay, so without further ado, let me get into the presentation. So uh, let me see if I can get my tablet into proper tablet mode. Let's see. Oops. Okay, so. Everyone can see the screen, and yes, I can see it myself, so that's probably a good sign. Okay, so we, so we're here to uh, so to uh, learn about something we've called die heaps. Um, die heaps are um, a particular kind of ternary algebra. So perhaps I should give a very brief introduction to what are uh, algebras, uh, what we refer to as algebras in this context. So basically, it's the simplest meaning of algebra that you've probably come across. Um, so there's some people that think that there have to be something related to vector spaces and having some operations. So we are actually going in a simpler, uh, in a simpler case of we, we say an algebra is basically a set, call it A. Uh, you can think of it of, as finite. We don't. We're not going to bother too much about infinitary questions here, um, and some operations with some operations. So I'll put the S in brackets. Um, so what, what is an operation? Well, an operation is uh, something that operates element of elements of the set, obviously. Um, so uh, there can be um, simple uh, unary operations. So something that's a unary operation. It's basically sending elements from the algebra to the algebra itself. Something can be a binary operation. So I'm going to say these are operations. So you can have a unary, you can have a binary. A cross A into A. 
and of course what this means is that you're taking pairs uh, you're taking tuples uh, of elements and taking them into a they, they could also be ternary so a cross a cross a etc so there's a convention that you say there's a zero re algebra basically one you take an element in a and to make the sort of zero uh, name more apparent you could think of this uh, sort of as you know a to the power of zero into a which is sort of a an inclusion of one one element uh, set into the set so it's like choosing an element uh, of the set right uh, so that so that would be a zero re algebra um okay so what are some examples of algebras i mean th th these are extremely uh extremely basic uh objects in mathematics in some sense these are the building blocks of most of modern mathematics or certainly set theoretic uh mathematics um and so what are some examples so of course uh let's begin at, at sort of a uh, sort of a preschool level mathematics uh when you're learning to count and you're learning to do addition and things like that so imagine that you have the natural numbers so we, we have zero we have one two etc you call these the natural numbers um and you define the operation to do addition for example with uh, the natural numbers so you do plus and plus of course is something that takes natural numbers pairs of natural numbers and gives you another natural number right so in this case uh if you if you take the natural numbers with um let's say we single out the zero because the zero has a very special uh behavior um we single out zero and we single out the operation plus and of course uh we have a few properties uh for this uh, for this uh, operation right so we know for example that you could do x plus y and that's the same as y plus x or you could you know that if you do x plus y plus z this is the same as um, x plus y plus z right so we have properties that we call associativity uh, below and uh, commutativity above um, and also the the behavior of zero so zero is a neutral element with respect to this binary operation so uh, you take zero plus x and you get x back for any for any value of x right so so these we say that uh, uh, this is an algebra so the natural numbers uh, form an algebra together with this operations and and i know it's a little bit weird to be calling the zero an operation but that's just sort of a, an easy uh, convention that when, whenever you have single dot elements you call them zero re operations um so of course um there you can come up with many 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 other examples um let's uh, let's think of a of a unary algebra that perhaps is you know not so often referred to as an algebra because obviously algebra begins at the level of binaries in, in the more historical sense um but a unary the example so okay let me say this is uh so these are the naturals now the two roles um another example uh, that involves a uh, unary uh could be for example the complex numbers so uh, this is something that you know you're, you're you've promoted from uh, preschool to maybe secondary school or something uh or high school and you have um you have learned about complex numbers and complex conjugation uh so in the case of complex numbers you have something uh i mean you, you have similar constructions to addition and multiplication and so on but what's relevant here is uh complex conjugation the, you know you can define as if you see complex numbers as being the plane uh as as doing a, a reflection about the the x-axis or you can see as uh, um, basically uh, changing the i uh, the i uh, components of the complex numbers you can see it several ways but basically <clears throat> what the operation is if i give you a complex number z conjugation uh is i'm going to denote it with a little star just for convenience although some people call it with a bar so the operation conjugation uh sends complex numbers to complex numbers right and it does so in a very specific way it does so linear linearly so you for example have an interaction between uh complex sorry sorry so before i say interaction so this 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 behaves in such a way that set gets sent to set star this is the notation 
and this is what we call an idempotent um, an idempotent uh, or, or actually uh, nilpotent uh, operation because when we do star squared meaning we apply the, the operation twice we, we get back to the same element so uh, you know when you do z star of star we get back um, z and now this is this is absolutely obvious if you are for example saying defining your your conjugation as you take your imaginary component and you minus sign it because then you apply minus i minus sign twice and that's just uh, the same thing or if you are doing reflections about an axis etc th these are obvious uh, constructions that have this uh, nil potency uh, operation um, and, and I say nil potency because technically uh, what, what you're doing here is that if you compose star with star what you get back is identity on the complex numbers and, and so that's why it's called uh, nil potent because it's, uh, it's sort of going back to, to, to doing nothing um, now this, this operation uh, so so you could you could for example highlight uh, several things on, on complex numbers you could highlight uh, C uh, you could highlight the zero if you want sort of the origin you could highlight addition and you could highlight the conjugation actually let me put it in the order that we normally do of increasing arity uh, and, uh, and sorry and uh, yeah addition that's right so um, just as terminology the number of arguments that you're you're required to fill in into a into a into an operation uh, it's called the arity so uh, these numbers here uh, the, you know this is this being zero this being one this being two this being three etc these are arities and it's called arity mostly as a as sort of a deformation of the term you know unary binary etc so ari is seems to be the common the common uh, Sort of term in those in those uh, words, and we just extract it. So, if you if you highlight the complex numbers as having a zero a unary, and a binary, um, there's some interesting interactions that happen, and you can write equations uh, among among these uh, operations, and uh, like like the equations we wrote for the natural type of which require some kind of uh, generic variable names like x, y, etc. So, um, what are some interesting interactions? So, for example, there's an interesting interaction of uh, conjugation and addition so you could have something like this uh, so we say that addition sorry conjugation distributes over addition or we would say it's linear or additive or something like that um, and we all already wrote down the sort of nilpotency condition uh, and and you know it's 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 kind of obvious that these things are going to behave in some in some ways so so this is the general introduction to the concept of an algebra uh, again it's very rudimentary very basic just a set with some operations uh, that that might satisfy some compatibility conditions in, in some degree of generality so let's see um, so Richard you're saying that there's a zero yes um, you mean that elements with zero imaginary component that the that conjugation is identity already right yeah 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 exactly yeah that's the point yeah. exactly you could you could you could you know single out uh things like that for example another interaction between these elements is that zero uh, conjugate is zero and so that's uh, technically although it looks like an element wise uh, operation because the zero has been identified as a zero operation that's actually a, an equation that you write and, and so on anyway so so Okay, so this is very general and probably uh, terribly boring for a lot of people that are very familiar with algebra already uh, that might be in the audience. So, um, what are we what are we talking about here? What is the what, what is the what is the topic of today's uh, of today's uh, presentation? I mean, as I said, I, I was going to discuss die hips and this this weird uh, name, die hip. And I guess the the best way to motivate uh, die hips is to actually well, first of all, explain where these uh, heaps uh, came from and, uh, and give a little bit of context of the sort of algebraic uh, landscape where these things uh, live, right? Um, so um, let, let's, try and, let's try and understand some, some very basic uh, binary operations, right? So, so you will see that we get, into, uh, we get into die heaps or heaps actually rather quickly and, and although they seem they sound exotic and it's they sound sort of like advanced in some sense they are actually quite elementary uh, algebraic structures so imagine that I have a set let me call it s now imagine that I have a set 
And imagine that um, what I consider is uh, only unary operations in this set, meaning I'm going to look at ways of sending elements to this set to elements of this set. So imagine that I consider these five maps generically from S to S, right? So the set of all such um, operations, the unary operations, uh, this in, in some terminology you might see it as, you know, in the category of sets, this is set S, S to itself, or you might even uh, see it written as end in set of S, etc. It's the collection of all possible functions from S to S. It's all the ways in which you can send all the elements to S to some other elements of S, right? Um, so, what is a natural, what is a natural, uh, in fact, not only natural, but in a way, the only thing you can do with, with no extra information. You just have a set, completely abstract set, and you have a collection of functions. So imagine that you single out two such functions. Imagine that I have a phi and a psi, such functions that send me S to S. What is something that you can do? Well, you can compose them, right? You can, you can say, well, take first the arguments in, in um, or the, the argument and fit it into phi, and then take the argument and fit it into psi. So, uh, what does that function do? So uh, technically, if you give me some x in s, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take psi of x, and that is again an element in s, and then I'm going to take uh, phi of psi of x, which again is an element in s. So the composite is, is a well-defined function, so it's again an, an, an element of the same set, right? So uh, let me give, it, give this a very simple name. I'm going to call this... Um, um, curly E for endo functions or endo maps. Um, so basically, if you see that if phi and psi are in E in that way, then this this construction, which I'm going to call uh, phi composed psi, um, of so so this is the notation here, phi composed psi of x. Uh, then this composition is also an element of E. Now, what we found is basically that in any set you have a binary algebra because given given two operations, uh, sorry, given two functions, you immediately get um, immediately get another one. So this means that whenever you have a so if I call this maybe sub S because there's some memory of the set that we're living on. Um, whoops. We have this and we have composition. This is a binary algebra. This we know for sure. But there's more than just a binary algebra because um, we know that if we are selecting elements uh, without any further choice, without any uh, extra information, we know that um, we can always just keep the same choice of an element. Right, so we know that we can take an x in s and say, okay, I'm gonna send that to exactly, sorry, to exactly the same element in s. Fair enough. What this is is basically the identity map on s. This is what we call the identity map or the identity function on s. Um, so not only do we have a binary a binary operation uh, here, but we also have a, a zero array. Um, sorry. Uh, a, a, um, I have a zero array algebra here, which is uh, identifying the, the identity. So let me actually call this one on, on S, just for convenience. And I'm gonna start dropping the one, the S in a bit. Um, so we actually have more than just that. Okay, actually, let me just keep this binary. And let me say that my brain really wants to write that psi for some reason. Um, and let me say that if I have this, uh, Identity, let's call it identity. Identity, yes. This is a, a unary, uh, sorry, zero -ary. algebra. Now, these two things interact in a very natural way, right? So when you consider them together, and now I'm going to use this much, uh, much uh, more shortened notation. Uh, I'm going to use one for the identity map. I'm going to use circle for composition. Um, we know that these things interact in a very natural way. Of course, if you uh, compose any arbitrary function psi in E um, and 
and you, you, you write down what, what, what it means to do this kind of composition, you would find that, you know, if you compose the element with psi, and then you do nothing with that. That's the same as composing, so doing nothing with the element and then composing it with phi, with, which is the same as just acting with phi, because the identity, as the name suggests, uh, leaves the, same, the thing unchanged, and so it does basically nothing. Um, so this is the same as doing psi, which is the same as doing psi, and then composing with the identity. So, so this zero re uh, element, uh, this zero re operation, which is just the choice of an element, a singled out element in the set of functions of a set, has this this particular property. But then, of course, we have a much more important property in some sense, uh, which is uh, the composition with itself, which is which is to say, what happens when you take uh, psi um, into into an element, and then you do phi into an element, and then you do whatever. Um, theta into an element, right? So you're basically sequentially uh, uh, acting on, on the same, on the same uh, um, argument. Therefore, the result, call it y, is a unique element. So, so this has a unique value. And therefore, it doesn't matter in which order I'm going to, I'm going to compose uh, these things for, for, it to, for it to give the same value in the end. So if I, if I decide to you know, evaluate uh, first the composition of phi with, uh, with uh, sorry, theta with uh, phi and act that on, on phi x, or I decide to um, first act phi on the composition of, sorry, uh, phi and psi on x, right? These two things are going to be the same. So if I undo this equation, you would realize that what I'm writing here is that theta composed with phi composed with psi acting on x must be the same. Oops, must be the same as uh, theta composed with phi composed with phi acting on x as a well. whole. Right. So, so we conclude that the, the, the binary operation is associative, like uh, like addition was in in our in our previous example. Um, so okay. So we found that um, this very special, uh, this very this very general, sorry, this very general. Uh, structure of a set with its functions has uh, this particular uh, structure has a has a single out element that behaves like a neutral element in this sense and and it has a binary operation that is associative this is what we call a monoid and i cannot stress enough um, how prevalent this, these objects are in mathematics if you're not familiar with monoids you actually are <laughs> so let me just put it that way um, so monoids are terribly uh, common. Uh, as a side note, I will mention that uh, the, the naming uh, conventions here are a little bit uh, uncomfortable because in, uh, in the context of category theory and, and sort of this higher algebra, oid is a, is a, is a, is a suffix that is usually uh, reserved for things that are partially defined. So for example, when you have a group uh, or a ring, uh, people talk of group oids or ring oids when you have the same sort of structure but only partially defined. So when, when not all the elements uh, can be operated together, but you have to, you know, take into account some some partial conditions. Um, monoid breaks this uh, breaks this uh, sort of terminological rule, which is very unfortunate uh, because you know you would expect that if this is a monoid, then a monoidoid will be the partial version of it. But a monoidoid is a category, <laughs> so uh, it's 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 a little bit it's a little bit wonky in that sense. Anyway, just a, a terminological side note. Um, okay, so monoids are, are quite interesting because um, they are raised they arise extremely naturally in in this very general setting of functions on, on any set. Um, but when when you learn um, the first example of abstract monoids that you learn in school, which are, are probably groups you actually uh, see them with an extra structure. So, so a, a group is a, so is, is a monoid that has some very specific extra structure. And that extra structure basically is inversion. So there's a sense in which uh, you have an element in your, in your monoid and you can always assign another element in the monoid. And so they together multiply to give the single dot element, which is the identity. This is the very trivial statement that when, you know, if I'm in a group in, uh, sorry, if, I, if I'm in a group G, and I have an element G in G, um, and now G is a monoid, so uh, we are in this in this setting. G becomes a group when you can assign to G some element. You call it G minus one. You might want to call it whatever uh, G star. 
uh, it's entirely up to you. But it is, you have an assignment of an element to an element, so again, a unary, um, and you, you have the particular property that the unary interacts with the binary in the following way. So you have G uh, multiplication with, so this is of course a group with operation, actually, let me just call it circle as well for consistency. Uh, when you do G is circle G minus one, uh, you get the identity back, right? Okay, so so what is the behavior of uh, this um, operation with respect to say uh, composition? So so this is this is the, the defining equation uh, between the zero re, the binary, and the unary. But from this, we actually get some some extra behavior. So so a group, um, I, I, I don't know. People in the audience, uh, they have uh, some some classical understanding of groups and if this matches or not. But the way you should see a group now is, you know, you have a group, you have a zero re, that is the identity, you have a unary, which is the inverse, which, by the way, I'm gonna, uh, do I, okay, let me just, uh, it's a bit confusing. Let me let me just be very explicit and call it like that to, to signify it's a, it's a binary. And I'm gonna call it circle for composition. So this being a group, um, means that all the all the axioms that we've discussed so far hold so uh, g with just one and composition is a monoid um, and the unary operation uh, satisfies this particular equation here right um, okay but there's more because you can actually derive that um, the unary operation interacts uh, in the following way so so the unary operation is uh, uh, has the properties that we've seen above right so the properties of the unary operation are as follows so when you do g minus one of g minus one, you actually get g back. So it's like uh, complex conjugation as we saw above. And uh, if you take g and h and you take its inverse, what you get is this particular pattern, which is some people might call an anti-homomorphism because it, it sort of swaps, uh, respects the algebraic structure, but swaps the the order of the of the of the elements. Um, so when you have these properties you are you find yourself in in the land of groups this is the this is the algebraic territory of of groups so I'm gonna put it here group now what happens when you um basically okay so groups have this very special uh this very special element which is the identity so imagine that you wanted to forget about this identity element, and you wanted to somehow uh, capture the the information of this binary operation and this zero area operation or the element uh, identity into into some other algebraic structure. What could you do? What could? How could we go about um, uh, doing this? And so the answer to this is one of the one of the celebrated results that again I'm just going going to. Uh, exposed here uh, instead of going into details because otherwise this will become a lecture in algebra and it's, it takes us hours um, but the main the main uh, takeaway that was uh, known for for actually a long time since the since the mid 20th century is that you can have uh, groups that effectively forget uh, where their identity is placed in the set or in other words groups that effect in which effectively all the elements can act as the identity um, uh, and 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 you could encode those as simply uh, ternary algebra so how does this work so the idea is as follows imagine and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take the exercise from the sort of punchline backwards so imagine that I begin with a ternary algebra uh, do we want to say that no actually I prefer to I prefer to begin with sorry I prefer to begin with uh, with a group. Um, so let's imagine that I have a group and I want to define a ternary, al ternary algebra. There's a very natural way in which you can define a ternary algebra, which is just taking any three elements and multiplying them together. So, you know, I could define some bracket uh, ABC for um, ABC in the group and simply define it as A times B times C. Now, this is well defined because I have associativity and I don't have to write brackets. Otherwise, I would have to specify where I place the brackets between uh, B and C or A and B. Um, okay, so fine, this is a ternary, a ternary operation, but of course, 
this is in some sense not doing much else because all you're doing is just concatenating these, these elements. Um, so perhaps we can do something more interesting. So let's define the square bracket ABC with the following definition that looks symmetric and so it probably holds some, some value in, in what it can do for us. So this operation now is going to satisfy something non-trivial because of course um, it, it has an, in, uh, an, an inversion of B which, satis which interacts with uh, composition in a non-trivial way. The previous, the previous formula above here was just composition twice and you know, that is as interesting as composition in some sense. Uh, but now this one has a combination of composition and inversion, and there, there might be something something interesting uh, lurking there. So, okay, let's see what this satisfies. Well, um, the first thing to, to ask when you have such an algebraic structure is to say, okay, what happens when you nest it? You, you might think, okay, that's, that sounds a bit abstract. What, what happens when you nest it? This feels a little bit, um, you know, technical, but think about the examples that we've seen so far. All these properties are effectively uh, questions about nesting these structures. In some sense, that's you know what a universal algebra is about, and for people who know universal algebra, that sounds very familiar. Um, but if you think about this, these operations, um, the the questions that we've been asking are essentially about nesting the operations, right? So if you if perhaps except for commutativity, which is has, which has to do more about order in, in your data structures. Um, everything else is about uh, nesting. I mean, think about the, co the conjugation proper, the property of conjugation uh, in complex numbers. That's just doing conjugation twice. So you're, you've nested it. Or you, you, we first did uh, binary uh, addition and then uh, conjugation. So that's again nesting, uh, uh, nesting the, the the order of, of application of those the, those maps. Similarly with associativity. Associativity basically means nested in one uh, one pair and then inside of the pair you put another another uh, operation and so on right so so these these have been the the general the general um philosophy of, of properties in algebra so let's let's try and write down the nesting of uh, this this particular operation so if i write it down a b and then you know another bracket here in place of c so i would write c d e for example um it is obvious from the expression above that if i write this out right I'm just going to spell it out. I'm going to do A cross B minus composed with, and now bracket, C composed with D minus 1, E. Right? It is clear that because these, these are um, uh, commutative operations, sorry, these are associative operations, um, I can just move the brackets around as I please. So if I put the bracket all the way to the left here, I would get the bracket on the other side. So it's clear that I can just move it to, no, use another color to, to highlight it. I could move it just here, just by displacing the, that expression. And you would get, you know, A, B, C as, as a ternary operation, and then uh, D, E on the other side. So it is pretty obvious that you can get easily A, B, C on this side, and then D, E on there. So we have something similar to associativity as before. We can move the bracket around. Now, um, what happens when you put the bracket in the middle? So if you put the bracket in the middle, we find this expression. We, have, we find a, b minus 1, c, d minus 1, e. So I will highlight this bracket. So that bracket um, doesn't immediately look like uh, the, the bracket that we, that we began with, which has the, the structure uh, element, compose element, inverse, compose element. However, you know that inverse satisfies this beautiful um, nilpotency property, and so I can effectively introduce uh, 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 inverses in the expression and basically rewrite this expression and say, okay, this is A compose. So what is B inverse? That's nothing but B inverse of inverse inverse. So I can I can express it as B. Um, sorry. B inverse of inverse inverse and this this feels very convoluted but bear with me so the point is that i want to get some actually um that's not what i want to say sorry i was making the argument for the c in the middle so let, let's keep just d inverse and b inverse as they are and sorry the problem is of course that we don't have an inverse in the middle element that's what i wanted to say um so we don't have an inverse in the middle element but 
of course c is just c inverse inverse so i can just write inverse here and put an inverse over inverse c so what i have now is an expression that has three inverses um, and as you know above here you can use that the inverse of the composition is basically the the swapped uh, composition of, of inverses and of course you apply this to each of the sides and whichever order you apply because the operation is, is, is associative there's no problem um, you get that this expression is a composed with uh, B sorry now it's gonna flip order so it's gonna go D over here and then C inverse is gonna remain in the middle and then B is gonna be over here and then the inverse is going to apply to the whole bracket um, so now we do see a pattern. We see that what's inside it's uh, it's the product that we've defined this product over here um, applied to the elements b c minus one b. So I'm just going to write that. What's inside the bracket is d uh, c minus one b. But now look at the look the, at the spread look at the expression as a whole. The expression as a whole has the structure of the product as well. It, it is some element in the middle, inverse, uh, composed and precomposed uh, with A and E. So of course, this is the ternary operation of A, that middle element that we just identified in the middle. Um, oh, my apologies. Uh, this is not inverse here, because of course, um, C, sorry, that's inverse there, but the, the pattern is that you, you our notation is that we don't write the inverse in the in, in, in the in the bracket. So that's just C over there. Um, so you have that element in the middle and then E on the sides. So that's a that's a curious looking axiom. So if I recap all the way up here and I basically delete all this process and I write the axiom that holds in the middle, what happens when you put the you sort of pull the bracket into the middle? So you can push the bracket all the way to the left from the right. Uh, but if you if you push it just to the middle what happens is that you f you swap uh, d and b so c remains in the middle but b gets swapped with d in that way okay so this particular operation um that we derived very explicitly through all this entire process um if i can yep this is called the semi -heap. And um, I don't have much uh, insight into why the word heap was chosen, other than tell you that historically, this was defined by a Russian mathematician who, uh, who used the term that apparently sounded like groups, uh, but it wasn't quite groups, and then it was translated as heaps. So uh, maybe Nick, some other time, can tell us uh, the nuances of, of the choice of words here, but uh, there's nothing terribly interesting, I don't think, in, in the choice of words. Um, so. Uh, Semi-heap uh, is basically a ternary algebra that satisfies that, that axiom, but the, the structure that we've defined satisfies something else. As many of you might be, uh, might be thinking already, the fact that we are using inverse, and inverse is some specific, uh, uh, so it's, it's a very special um, uh, operation in groups, we actually have a stronger behavior than, than simply a semi-heap. And, and by that I mean that you could have A uh, and then a repeated element and, and what happens is, of course, you have A compose B inverse compose B. But of course, B inverse compose B is just the identity element. So this is indeed just A, right? And similarly on the other side, um, if you have, uh, I can write it with A if you want, A, A, B, this equals, you know, A compose A minus one compose B, which is B, right? So this property, um, Group of stuff, heap of stuff, yeah. But uh, but certainly, uh, certainly, uh, valid logic that was probably followed by the the person who who decided on the name. Um, so um, so so we have this further properties. So with these two further properties, what we find is what we call a heap. Okay, so. I hope that you see that this is. Uh, so, by the way, um, if you if you think that groups are too abstract, you you, you can define your favorite heap simply uh, on on um, on the integers, for example, by by taking you, know, you take the integers and you take the operation 
defined as follows. So n m l is defined as, as you can imagine, n minus m plus l. Right? It's it's really not that not that interesting. Of course, um, here you have also commutativity because you can you can uh, move your 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 n and l around. So commutativity here just means that n and l can be swapped. But obviously m cannot be because uh, this is not the same as uh, n l m because obviously this is not the same as in general um, minus l plus m right because the, the placement of the minus sign actually introduces this sort of asymmetry in the definition of the graph anyway so you have a very natural definition of a of a heap so okay um you may be thinking, all right, so I, I, see, I clearly see how if you have a group or something like the integers, you can get a heap. But what about if you give me a heap, can I reconstruct back uh, something like a group? Is that, is that possible? So let's play that game. And with that, I think uh, we, the, the, the justification of the, of the point of the paper that we, we, that we run will be, will be quite clear. So let me just introduce the terminology that A, uh, that an element satisfying this property um, so actually let me write it as a single element satisfying the property so there's a, there's a b here I uh, wrote the same thing twice wonderful uh, b b a b b minus a so this is so we say b is uh, a by unit element and the reason that we use by unit is because it behaves kind of like a unit remember we called it one for unit when we had that behavior over here right so um, we now have two copies of the same element behave like a unit so that's why we call it a by unit that's kind of the, the logic in, in, in naming um, so we say b, b is a by unit element like that so in a heap every element is a by unit because all of all elements uh, behave like that by definition. So, what 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 if so so? Let's let's see what, what we can do when we, we begin with a with a semi heap um, and a by unit element, which you can see as a heap in any choice of elements. So imagine that S has a ternary operation um, that is a semi heap, and um, imagine that let's say E in S is a by unit element. Okay, so what can we do with this? All right, um, there's not many things that we can actually do. I mean, this, this is one of the things I always like about algebra that you are always in a very small, especially when you do this kind of algebra, you're always in a very small uh, face space of possibilities that you can that you can try out. Um, so. If the, if the game here is, I begin with a semi-heap and a choice of by unit element, and my goal is to get to a group, something that looks like a group or something that looks like a, like a semi-group or, or is resembling, resembling something like a group, um, what should I, what, what can I do? Well, it's obvious that if you chose any two elements in S, you could define binary operations by uh, what is called currying the, 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 the elements in, in your operation. And in particular, I'm going to suggest that we define, oops, that we define the following currying. So I'm going to define the operation square e in the obvious way. So this operation is defined by taking x, uh, e, y. So you take the, the element in the middle. Okay, fair enough. Um, and now the question is, what axiom does this operation satisfy? And I mean, I'm not going to go through the the check, but it's a very fairly straightforward check that if you do x uh, e, uh, sorry, compose with y e z like that, um, you you would basically write down these formulas, right? You would just replace x uh, for a, b for e, and, and so on, and you would notice that the the two formulas that make sense. In, in the notation that you found are the left the left side and the right side and those are precisely the fact that you can move the brackets around so you actually find and this is maybe an exercise for the audience if you feel like doing some algebra this evening um, 
you can just play around with with the with the bracket above, and you would you would find this property. So we get an associative uh, operation. Okay, that, that's interesting. So from a semi heap, whenever we have an uh, we ha whenever we have a by unit element, we actually find a, a semi uh, uh, an associative operation. Okay, interesting. But not only that, but actually e the single dot element that we that we consider has a uh, single dot behavior uh, with respect to this binary operation. And this is a fairly obvious check. This this I can do live because it doesn't take that long. So if you have this and you put e as part of the binary operation, this is of course by by definition just x e e, which is of course by assumption that this is a by unit element is just x. And similarly in in the other placement, right? is just e e x which is just x so it turns out that e induces by currying this way induces a binary operation that is associative with respect to which it is a neutral element so lo and behold you have from a semi heap and a by unit element maybe i'll draw a big arrow here from this pair of semi heap and by unit element we have constructed s with e and the operation and this is uh, already a monoid as we saw above because it's a binary operation that's associative and with a with an element that acts uh, in this uh, in, in this way as an identity so in fact we have more than a monoid because the other thing that you can do with e is uh, when you try to carry it in some in some kind of symmetric way the first obvious thing is to place e in the middle and you have something symmetric the other the other um, um, choice is to define an, a, a map can i call mu sub e which takes an element x and produces um, e x e Right, so it carries E on both sides, and so you have a slot in the middle, and you basically just plug uh, the, the element there. So this is a unary uh, operation, um, and the question is, what does this unary operation do? Uh, how does this behave with respect to, to, the, to the operation? Again, this is going to be uh, a, an exercise for the audience. Uh, and I'll just sketch what, what this uh, looks like. So if I take uh, mu E acting on on some binary operation here, so uh, x binary with e y. This, I mean, I'll, I'll just write it out. I won't. I won't do the proof. If you write this explicitly, you unpack the notation. You will have e uh, inside. You will have the expression for that, which is again x e y, and then e outside again. So you have this kind of expression, and these brackets we, we can just drop here because we have the square brackets to keep track of that so you can manipulate the expression it's actually quite quite easy to see that the property that e is a by unit allows you to show that this will be the same as doing mu e with uh, y and x swapped positions mu e of x so it turns out that um, sorry that s with e with mu e and square e which are which is an, a set with a zero array with a unary and with a binary this is an involuted monoid okay and what's more if if you assume that you 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 can do this for any elements so involuted monoid means that you have a monoid where this property so let, let, let me just say abstractly here so you have m with um with a one and with a star and with a circle composition or binary operation an involuted monoid means that you have star behaving like a like an involution so it is nil potent like like above so you have x star star equals x and then you have um x circle y star equals y star um, x star so basically like what we had with inversion in groups but but a bit more general because we're not assuming that the star acts like a like an inverse with respect to the identity element so we've shown that given a semi heap with a by unit element you you get by an involuted monoid i mean this was clearly the case uh the other way back 
because we we are from a, from a, uh, from from a group which was a particular case of an involved with mono you get you got this this operation now but imagine that all elements in your in your semi heap are by unit elements which is the case of a heap as we introduced earlier then uh, you actually have a, a, a this, the specific the specific property that your involution actually acts as an inversion because when you when you find the, the same element twice you can actually cancel it out so it turns out that in uh, in um, when 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 again if you want to do exercise when s is heap so you know for all s in s s is by unit um then then you can clearly show that um what what is before we called an involuted monoid here s e mu e e is actually a group for which um mu e equals inversion so so the idea the idea is i mean let me maybe use s to be consistent here the element s um, square s and mu s here. Um, so, so, so that's basically the takeaway. Um, uh, this is the classic result uh, by, by this uh, Russian mathematician that, uh, that pioneered these this structures. Um, the, the takeaway is you can either do groups on, on one side and, and then construct ternary algebras on the other, or you can um, consider these these families of ternary algebras and uh, sorry th these ternary algebras and then they uh, package essentially families of groups. Um, uh, something that is connected to this result, but maybe is a bit beyond the point, is that if you and some of you might be wondering if you choose two elements, two by unit elements uh, of the same semi heap uh, uh, or two, two, any two elements in a heap. Um, what are the groups? How are the groups related when you construct them? The, this this uh, involuted semi semi groups. The answer is they are isomorphic. They are canonically isomorphic with a with a unique isomorphism. They're specified by by the choice of by the pair of choices of elements. So um, that result, uh, which I might summarize, I mean, this is sort of uh, Wagner's theorem. Um, this uh, this result basically tells you that. You can take um, any semi heap with a choice of by unit element, and that's in one to one correspondence with involuted semi groups. And what's more, when you restrict to uh, when you restrict to heaps, you you can you can um, you can find the, this this correspondence between uh, heaps and effectively um, what do we want to say? You can so these are I don't know. This uh, Bernard might remember the terminology here, but I think uh, these are classes um, of uh, groups. Bernard, do you remember the the term that that people use for this? You can just write groups. 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 So idea is that with every heap, you can associate some class of isomorphic groups. Yes. Yes. And with every group, you can uh, have a heap. But two somehow different groups, still isomorphic, can give you one. You can. And I, I, I will say one more thing. Also, uh, study started from Germans, actually. In oh, yeah. 1946. Yeah. And then Russians started to study semi heaps. So, pictures started with Germans and heaps, and then Russians started to study generalization of that mm -hmm. yeah yeah in fact the, the the narrative that i presented which came from uh, constructing heap like uh, structures 
um, that was originally German, as Bernard was pointing out. And, and uh, the, but the first time that there was a, an abstraction of the of the ternary uh, operation was was due to this uh, this chap Wagner. Okay, so yeah, so so yeah, classes of groups. So I guess the um, the the takeaway here is that you you package classes of groups that are isomorphic uh, to each other um, in in a single ternary operation. That, that is one one of the takeaways is first uh, these algebraic structures. If you found them in the wild, in some sense, if you just stumbled upon these axioms, maybe uh, here people are familiar with the meta mathematics project in, in Wolfram or with our searches for uh, sort of for abstract theories and things like that in the Wolfram Institute. So if you were to systematically enumerate axioms and you stumble upon uh, an axiom that looks like the ones that I wrote above here, th these equations, um, the these equations here, the semi heap and heap equations. Um, you, in principle, have no idea whether this, uh, these structures are related to anything that you know. Obviously, they look very familiar because the formulas look similar to, to, to the associativity axioms of groups and semigroups, etc. But, so, but this theorem sort of formalizes that, that relation. The theorem tells you that uh, if you have a semi-heap and you choose it by units, you choose something that is basically as close as you can get to an identity element in a ternary algebra, where you are finding is actually exactly involuted semigroups, which, uh, by the way, is something that, as Bernard was pointing out, was being being widely studied at the beginning of the 20th century and has been studied since, uh, and it's still actively an area of research today. Um, uh, so that's for a semi-heap with a choice of a unit. Now, for a heap, which is a, a structure that has uh, by units everywhere, so all elements are by units, what you end up with is classes of isomorphic groups, right? And uh, one of the uh, one of the in my opinion, most beautiful applications of um, of this idea is in uh, in the notion of uh, of, uh, of affine geometry and how you can uh, recapture affine geometry as a single uh, ternary algebra instead of having the action of a of a set of uh, vectors and a set of points and things like that. And so I won't I won't go into the details just not to make it very long, but effectively. Um, the, the 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 takeaway or the sort of the summary of of, uh, of this uh, sort of affine uh, characterization is that you could have in one hand here uh, an affine space uh, space uh, thought of as you know a uh, some vector space v and some affine map call it alpha that sends you know v cross a into a which is basically the translation map, right? You give me a point, you give me a vector, and then I translate that point along that vector. Uh, so an affine space with this sort of data is actually, um, and here Bernard probably can, can tell me the, the quick answer here. Is this, is this here a truss that, that, I, that I want to write down, or is this here a heap? Oh, uh, it's 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 a little more complicated. You it's a bit more right. Yes, that's true. That's true. Let's say that you substitute a billion group. So when you have vectors, you can add them, right? If you add two vectors, you get a vector. So the idea is that you substitute this addition of vectors with ternary operation. Exactly. Then it, it's it's you know whenever you are somewhere, you think about where you stand as a beginning, and all the vectors are spanned from this point. But our space, why should it have some kind of start? So the idea is that you can translate them anywhere. And to grasp the translation in a proper way, the ternary operations appears and simplify the computation. So I would say it's a heap with something more, plus something. Yeah, exactly. So so you could, exactly, so, so you, you, can, you can add the, the structure, but I guess the the main the main point here is that the structure lives solely on one set. So you could have um, uh, one in one direction. I guess that direction is is that idea. The other direction, the idea, is that um, you have a a, a a ternary operation of a of the affine space, and what this operation is um, is the quadrilateral. Is the quadrilateral operation. So if you give me, I mean, I have conveniently a plane here to draw. So if you give me three points, imagine that this is my affine space. You give me any three points, 
kind of draw them a bit randomly like that. You you can canonically in Euclidean geometry construct, you know, the line that, oh, sorry, the, the line that draws these two, the line that draws those two, and then you can take parallels, you can take parallels, and then you have an intersection over there, right? So you actually find a new point uh, out of three points. So if you do this construction, uh, this just completely trivial uh, sort of uh, quadrilateral completion construction, uh, formally, if you if A is your set of, of points in, in your fine space, you are you are taking um, this kind of operation. So it turns out that when when you put some some uh, so when you when you when you compute this, it turns out that this satisfies the the semi heap axioms. So so this this actually behaves like like a semi heap. And, uh, and as Bernard says, when you add something else there to to um, to basically codify uh, what we what would mean to translate or to be sort of translated by an element, you get back the the definition of a fine space, which is effectively the idea of fixing an origin and, and, and things like that. So so this is actually uh, uh, one of the one of the more beautiful parts of I think uh, this story about heaps is that you. It's an instance that of something that I don't think many people are aware of, and I certainly wasn't aware of uh, more than a year ago, uh, which which is that you can package um, multiple algebraic structures in interaction, something like a, like an affine space, in a higher RET single algebra, right? And and this is for for and, and this and these uh, equivalencies are s sometimes not complete or or one to one in in the sense that here. Uh, the the notion of the ternary algebra needs some some has the freedom of choice of, of origin for example um, but um, but there is there is something interesting there that wasn't that wasn't found before so anyway so so this is this is the classic uh, the, the classic theory so if if people got uh, some some idea out of this uh, I think uh, the, the the idea of the paper and we're not really getting at the hour. Uh, mark uh, in the in the live stream, so I guess a good point to uh, to to give the give the sort of the content of the paper of what, what we did. Effectively, what we did is, is very childish in, in some sense. So so we in twenty twenty two proposed the following idea. We say, imagine that you begin with the same the same ingredient. So you begin with a semi heap. So ternary algebra with that funny looking associativity axiom where you have, you know, the brackets can move to the left and to the right and when they go to the middle, they, they swap the, the elements on the sides. Um, and then we said, okay, so if we have three entries in our, in our operation, the most general notion of, of identity, something that, you know, uh, you, you can see an identity in the following way, right? So there are many ways in, to interpret this, this, this formula, you know, one times X equals X equals uh, one times x, sorry, equals x times one. So there are many ways in which you can interpret this operation. So one way to interpret that is that if you give me an element one, right, in my set, I can, and I have a binary operation, I can define a unary, which is basically currying, right? This thing is a map that sends m to m, and this thing is a map that sends m to m, right? So which these are maps that basically tell you, give me an argument and I'll multiply by this chosen element, right? Um, so the, the property of, of, of identity of, uh, of unit here really means, or is telling us that you want these two maps to be equal to the one map that I know exists on, on M, which is the identity, right? That's one way to, to phrase it. So if I transport this uh, concept directly to the, the context of a ternary algebra, um, if, I, if I have a ternary operation, this, this square brackets, um, and, and I, I, I tell you, well, I, I want to get a unary out of it. Well, the first thing you want to do is to fill it with a couple of arguments, right? I mean, you can fill it in three different places, but let's just consider these two because uh, the story becomes much, much cleaner. So these, these are unary operations, right? And the question is, you know, in general, I'll just put, I'll just throw a random element, you know, A, B, whatever it is, uh, two, two elements, because there's two arguments. And so if I demand that this is the identity map, right, um, or maybe partially left and right, if you do it independently, or each one of them, um, this 
is a more parsimonious notion of by unit. And so when this is the case, and effectively you have you know a pair A B technically in S cross S because we're the order needs to needs to be kept technically because the, the, these are arguments in an operation um, such that A B X equals X equals X A B you call these a by unit pair. So this was basically our contribution uh, after, you know, or before, sorry, our contribution before doing the hard work of proving some theorems uh, was to essentially look at these things by unit pairs instead of by unit elements. Um, and, and so the conclusion was that you, you essentially obtain, so the, the algebraic structure speaks its own language and tells you, actually, I like this definition. So you end up having results such as uh, when, you know, if, uh, you know, you have an A in S such that there exists a B in S um, that A, B is by unit pair, let me just call them by units for now, then it turns out that B is unique, right? There's actually a unique B that satisfies that. Um, so there's also the result that uh, if uh, a b is by unit, let me just say by unit. A b by unit, then b a by unit. So in some sense, it's uh, it's the unordered pair of of elements that constitutes uh, uh, a by unit, uh, not 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 the, the set of the two elements. So. In a way, uh, this definition is telling you I am as close as I can be to to being a single element, right? Because it, it, you know, when one exists, when 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 there's a there's there's a, a one that exists that makes a pair, it's actually unique, and there's no order between them. So in in a way, mathematically, you are as close as possible to being a single element. Of course, uh, when uh, a equals b, uh, uh, this this recovers the definition of a by unit element that we had before. And, and so all these uh, results are trivial in that case because A equals A and that, that's all trivial. But um, th this is an interesting, I want to comment on this because uh, this is the kind of thing that you, you don't really write in a paper uh, because it is a completely trivial technical observation. But I quite like this, uh, this, this particular uh, sort of uh, aspect of, of this particular investigation because um, it tells you that by defining a natural definition of bi-unit pair, um, you somehow discover what the the structure is, is telling you that should be should be the right definition by by finding all these theorems. Anyway, so what is the so what is the analog? So now, as you can imagine, instead of uh, having a theorem that relates a semi heap with a by unit element, we're going to have a theorem that that basically does the same but with a by unit pair. Um, and so what we found is that you know you have a semi heap with a by unit pair and this corresponds to what we call switch semigroups uh semigroups yeah actually we, we call them switch monoids which is what it was switch monoids so, again, um, I invite you to read the paper at uh, this point. Uh, the, the paper is, I think, quite accessible. If, if, you, if you have any fluency in algebra, you will find it relatively easy to, to go through. Um, there are many results that are there just for uh, archival purposes. I mean, we basically gathered many results. Um, but but I, you, you, might be, you might be wondering, what is a switch mono? And, and, and this is where the, the flavor, the, the, the higher arity flavor of, uh, of, of this investigation got more interesting. Um, and basically a switch uh, is a generalization of an involution, right? So, so let, me, let me just talk about that for, for a couple of minutes and then, and then we will either open it for questions or end the stream if people are tired. Because I mean, this was much longer than expected, uh, uh, perhaps much longer than I wanted, but otherwise expected. Um, 
So, so, so switch. Uh, so, okay. So, what is a so what is an involution? Let's just an involution we saw before, but let me just recap very briefly. So, an involution, it's a unary map. Uh, let's say in a semigroup uh, or monoid M, it sends M to M, and it behaves in the way that you know star composed with star is identity. So, actually, let me just write the equation so it's easier x star star equals x and x y star equals y star x star right so if uh, you have such a if you have such a, a structure an involuted monoid so a monoid m with a binary operation and such an involution you can always construct a semi heap um, with the construction that we saw above. So this is nothing new. So you can make this construction and just write the formula that we wrote above, right? Okay, uh, this would be a semi-heap. Now, how can we generalize this? The generalization, um, so, so, okay, so what happens when I take the the switch sorry when I, what happens when i take the involution of the terrority operation that's something that you can ask right um so what happens when i do star of xyz when you do star of xyz what you get is x y star z star and then of course this is an involution so i just apply the formula to the whole thing which means that i permute I put the star in and I permute everything. So set star here, compose y star star, compose x star, which is set star, compose y, compose x star. Right? X star. Um, so of course on this side, what I had is, um, if I undo the, the bracket, I have x y star set star so this particular formula here seems that seems like something that you could demand uh, sort of primarily from from a map so if i have a map on my monoid m i could simply demand that uh, particular uh, that particular um, behavior so i can say phi is a switch when um, that pattern happens so it's x composed with phi y composed with set equal phi composed with set y phi acting on x right so th so that so this particular weird pattern seemingly weird pattern that in in a way it's kind of quadratic in in phi you have this uh, you know it's not it's not quite like i mean it's a bit similar to uh, to the just the involution formula but uh, it has sort of uh, phi twice in 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 the expression and and in, in that sense it's kind of a mixture of these two things uh, oops sorry what is this uh, i lost my controls okay um, so it's a bit similar to these two, uh, but just in in a single in a single uh, equation. So it's it's uh, yeah it, it's an it's an axiom that, that allows you to to combine those two. So it turns out that um, of course what you need to recover uh, um, a something like a monoid structure, so a sufficient condition for the monoid structure. To, to define a, a semi heap is precisely this, and and again, this could be an exercise if you really like to spend your evenings manipulating symbols on a piece of paper. This is a relatively easy ex exercise to do, which is that if you would like to reconstruct uh, a semi heap from an involuted monoid or a monoid that has some kind of endo map, if you just write this expression, uh, sorry, what I mean is if you just write this expression, x y z, you sub phi you define it as x compose phi y compose z right you're in some monoid m one compose you would you would find that 
this requirement, this switch condition is kind of a, a sort of a minimal requirement that you can ask, or, or a, I don't know if minimal, but at least a, a natural sort of uh, minimal expression formula that you can demand of the map phi so that this ternary operation becomes a semi heap. So if um, you agree that by unit pairs are um, relevant and they are natural, and you agree that semi heaps deserve to exist in you know in your mathematical land, then these switch monoids are are completely justified in their existence, right? Um, <coughs> so this is one of the class of algebraic structures that we sort of discovered in a way that we uh, sort of unveiled as being naturally defined and being worthy of investigation. Um, the other is the one that the natural uh, the natural analog of a group in this context, and this is really the end of, of my presentation. Uh, uh, so, the the next the, the so so the natural uh, follow up to this is okay. So so you you told me that you have uh, uh, I mean you can read the paper to see the cor the correspondence between semi heaps with the unit pair and switch monoids, but you know. That's just one part of the correspondence that we found earlier in the classic results by Wagner, where you know semi heap with bi unit element was an involuted semi group, but we could also specialize this to a heap with a class of groups. And this story of basically heaps being some kind of a fine version of, of groups. Um, so the quest, the natural question is: Okay, um, what is the heap analog in this in this context? And and that's exactly what we are defining as a die heap. So a die heap, die heap basically is the semi heap such that for all A in D there exists, and if it exists is unique, uh, B in D such that <coughs> AB is by unit. In other words, these are semi heaps in which every element belongs to a semi to a, sorry to a by unit pair. So all elements are by unit pairs. Um, and again, as I said earlier, to say pair or to say element here is almost it's kind of a blurred line because uh, it might be that many of them are. Um, Many of them are uh, just single elements, and so they are their own uh, by unit uh, partner. Or some of them ha might have distinct uh, by unit partners. Um, but uh, but that's the definition. So um, I guess the, the 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 final comment here is, without making this any longer, is that um, we have uh, in the paper we have examples, and maybe I can just briefly so. So we have a result that tells us, uh, perhaps this is the, mo the, the first comment that, uh, that is relevant here. So, so once you've defined a, a, a class of algebraic structures, um, it is not obvious that these things are, you know, it is not obvious that all semi heaps, uh, sorry, it's not obvious that all heaps happen to be, um, there we are. it's not obvious that all die heaps so defined happen to be heaps, right? Because um, a, a die heap uh, just makes the formal distinction that the there's a pair of elements that that makes a by unit pair, but obviously it could be that that distinction is is too much to ask, and and you actually always end up with having a a as as pair. So it just b is just a variable name for something that always happens to actually be forced to be equal to a. So this is not the case. We we know that this is not the case because we have examples in which this doesn't happen. Um, but and and we have a result that is that is interesting, which is that. Um, when you take um, a, a die heap that is as a semi heap, meaning without regards to the behavior of the bi unit elements, as a, as a semi heap is isomorphic to a heap. So that means that, that you, you, you have a way to map a one to one uh, between a die heap and a heap. And, uh, and, and the mapping really only knows about the ternary operation. It doesn't. It doesn't know about the bi units. When you have that map, then uh, the die heap becomes isomorphic to the heap. So, um, 
in the category of so let, let me rephrase this in the category of semi heaps heaps and die heaps are um uh sorry in the category of semi heaps um all semi heaps all die heaps that are isomorphic to heaps are actually heaps in in this sense uh so they're, they're not only isomorphic as semi heaps uh, that's why i say in the category of semi heaps if they are isomorphic to heaps they are actually heaps um so so that gives you a, a sense of the rigidity of the definition of, of heap right because it tells you that if you are if you are equivalent to uh, uh, be, there's an equivalence as semi heaps between uh, die heap and a heap they actually are heaps so th they, they retain the sort of uh, tighter algebraic structure now the other the other comment is um and i guess i can just um put it here so example 3.19 if anyone wants to check that in the paper um you can have uh, any abelian group will actually give, give you a, a so any a g abelian group um will give you a, a, a an example of of a semi heap sorry of a die heap that otherwise fails to be to be a, to be a heap and and so this is a very trivial construction but i guess it's just illustrating that there's a there's at least an, there's a non-empty class of uh, non-heap die heaps which sounds like a mouthful but this is sort of what we're going to um and the construction is as follows so if you have uh you know you have an abelian group g you take uh where's, where's the map here yes actually it, this is the funny this is the funny one but in order to prove this what you do is um you define x y set precisely as x plus y plus set and this this looks wrong from the earlier definition with which i had a minus sign in the middle but because these are because this is an, ab an, an abelian group and you can effectively move elements around your axiom basically looks like a list looks like sorry looks like an unordered list of, of elements so your your semi heap axiom is automatically satisfied in a in a, in a way it's very trivial that it's that is satisfied because you just have you know a b c d e and that's just an unordered list of elements so you can arrange them in whichever way you like and you can place brackets in whichever way you like and then you're gonna you're gonna satisfy in particular the axioms of semi heap so this is certainly a semi heap uh, in particular it's in fact a, an abelian semi heap but it's much much more symmetric than an abelian semi heap in fact but it's a semi heap in particular and it has the property that um any pair uh so 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 if you take any pair of any element sorry a in g um and you define the pair a minus a right so you obviously end up finding that a minus a is a bi unit element because obviously by construction if i do x a uh, minus a I just do x plus a minus a which is just x obviously um and and the other way around so you so you find that for any element you take its inverse in in an abelian group and you find a die heap right so it is a fairly trivial uh, example in the sense that i mean it is not very terribly exciting to say okay yeah obviously you have an abelian group you can do all these things but it is interesting when taken in in combination with the other theorem that tells you that when a die heap is a semi heap isomorphic to a heap then they are actually uh then that it be, it's actually a heap um th this tells you that, that there's a non-empty class of uh of proper die heaps that are that are not uh heaps right so anyway so so this is just sort of a an overview from the very basic algebra that you probably spent too long on uh just um explain the basics of algebra but i guess for, for the benefit of people watching here um all the way into how we got to to this to this question of switch switch monoids and uh, and die heaps and so of course the open question that that i personally have at, at this point um is that die heaps so clearly uh, heaps are this affine version of groups so the question is what kind of uh algebraic structure 
is uh, is the dihedra and a fine version of, right? Um, and so, obviously, we know the. I mean, we actually know the answer uh, about this. We know the answer for this uh, because uh, I mean they are switched monoids. There's some kind of particularly symmetric uh, switched monoids, particularly cancellative switched monoids, where uh, where a switched monoid is here on the screen is basically any any uh, monoid M with a binary operation that satisfies this uh, equation here, right? So so it's not a mystery. Uh, we know that we know that these uh, these things are. Uh, uh, sort of classes, isomorphism classes of uh, such switch monoids. But the question is, what are switch monoids more than just uh, involution monoids? Uh, and again, you can you can forget about the ternary the ternary level and just come back to uh, involutive algebra, uh, involutive involutive semigroups, and so on, and uh, and ask the, and and use the result that we have for die heaps to basically identify a class of um, generalizations of involuted semigroups or involuted monoids and say are these any are, are these of any use to some open questions in semigroup theory uh, are, are, are these uh, potentially uh, holding some particular behavior that makes them useful for some form of representation theory or you know whatever whatever it is that, that you might be thinking that semigroups are, are good for and the the non the non-zero uh, the non-empty community of people in the world working on semigroups uh, might be might be interested in in, in this class of uh, of, of semigroups because of course you can just throw random axioms that involve some kind of map um, and and it will generally be quite hard work to show that some you know some generalization of an evolution might might make some sense this is one case I mean this research really just you could be reduced to basically being one case in which we know this works out. So if you if you throw down something that looks like this equation, um, we the the theory of, of heaps and semi heaps behind it tells you that there is a there is a very uh, natural story there is a very rich uh, uh, algebraic landscape uh, lurking in the background. So perhaps it's, it's indicative that those particular involution monoids or involution semi groups are uh, are of interest. So anyway, uh, that's uh, probably way too long for uh, the, the the intended the intended explanation but uh, now we can we can have more of an open open discussion and maybe Bernard can highlight some of the some of the aspects that he finds particularly interesting about our work and sort of some follow-up questions and, and so on but yeah so Richard or Nick if you have any questions uh, or any follow-up comments uh, please go ahead I'm going to leave the blackboard here available just in case. Um, so, uh, Bernard, I, I actually uh, wanted to, I mean, maybe, I mean, we did this work uh, about a year ago now, but I'm curious like, what what excites you most about this, uh, this thing we did. Uh, sorry, I was turning on light. Uh, yeah. You're asking? Yes, yes, yes. No worries. Uh, I'm in general interested in algebra and in ternary operations, so it's somehow natural for me to consider them. But uh, essentially, there is this a fine nature of all what is happening here. So there is classical interpretation of a group as a representations or representation of. Uh, transformations of uh, vector space, right? Yeah. Uh, which is very nice. And when you're looking at semigroups, then you don't, you, you still have something like that on automorphism of vector space. But if you try, so semi heaps actually have also very nice representation. And that's main main reason why they're interesting to me. Whenever you look at the homomorphism between two vector spaces which have different uh, dimension then morph composition of morphisms uh, it it doesn't hold like you, you cannot compose of morphisms of the uh, of two arrows to the same space but with different domain right yeah but for semi heaps you can do that so as long as we have finite dimension we have uh, dual space 
which gives us the star and we can consider a semi heap of all the transformation between two uh, different uh, vector spaces. So they naturally appear in some kind of representation, but not representations of one vector space, but a maps between mm. two vector spaces, right? So this is the yes. main, somehow, uh, main interest of mine. And right. also the interesting fact is exactly how heaps are somehow connected to affine spaces, right? And we like to describe everything in vectors in fixed in one point, which is somehow unnatural to me. I, I'm not a physicist, so I don't understand a lot of co complicated stuff in the description of a space, but a fine space seems much more natural to me that, you know, we don't choose any point. Mm -hmm. And this is something that naturally is described by heaps. Yeah. And semi heaps should also describe somehow fine nature between different spaces, right? So, so this is something that motivates me. Uh, I I might mess uh, do a little mess in your mind right now because it was very algebraic. But there is also the uh, intuition behind it coming from geometry and vector spaces, yes. which can motivate, right? So yes. so we. It's not really just plain algebra, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think, let, let me pick up on two of the comments that you made, because I, I, I thank you for your uh, input here, because um, the first comment was the, the, the fact that you find semi-heap structures or heap structures in maps between vector spaces. This is very interesting because um, without going into the more categorical language for the audience not to get completely lost, uh, but the I guess the construction that you're referring to is that if I have two vector spaces, let's say V and W, um, I I can look at maps between them, something like this, and and of course if these are not if if these are of different dimensions, uh, it doesn't make any sense in general to ask for an inverse um, going going backwards, but you do have um, the construction of a dual. Uh, vector space, right? Um, which do you start here? Which allows you to define, so I'm curious actually to know the details of this, because so, so this allows you to define the dual of, of a map, right? In, in this way. Um, I'm just wondering How do you, I mean, I mean, you don't really get maps here, right, In uh, canonically. So if a space is finite dimensional, you have canonical maps, which sends the basis of W to, to, to the, the delta X goes to delta X, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but OK, so but that's but that's a non-canonical isomorphism as vector spaces, right? I mean, you have you have to choose a basis to build it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. So I I, I see. So if that's interesting. So if you do this plus basis, uh, let's call this B prime or whatever W, and this plus basis, um, then for sure we have this. I completely agree. I mean, you need finite dimension, right? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. This is thin dim. In the category of final dimensional vector spaces, for sure. Um, I completely agree. Then, um, yeah. And then I guess, uh, okay. So, in this in this situation, then we can whenever you have v and the choice of bases. You, you, you know that this is an isomorphism here. So you can effectively uh, construct a, a, a perp. So this is a dual, but it, you know, using these isomorphisms, you know, call this whatever, a phi v and call this phi w. Um, so you can define from a, from a phi like this, you can define a call it phi perp 
um, by composing, right? So phi per is basically just going the other way. So so you do whatever, like phi uh, v inverse uh, phi star um, phi w, something like that, right? So the point is that you have a well-defined uh, notion of, of transpose, right? And uh, for, for a more general context than this, by the way, for a more, not more general, so for a different, simpler context than this, you can, so you're, here is working on the field in vector space over whatever, some field F. Um, you can also work over set. Um, so you, you, you can be working on uh, set. What I want to say is you can be working over, sorry, set as a category and in which your morphisms are relations right so so you could have just simply x uh, goes to y as a relation r where r is simply a subset of x cross y right so so you can always define the, the the transpose relation you can basically just say you know if x is related to y then uh, you can define a relation x related to sorry y related to x whenever x related to y Right, so uh, you can you can define always this in in that, and it's not true that um, R composed with R T is just the identity on X or, or, or on Y, right? Like you, this is not gener generally the case. Um, so in both these situations, you end up with a construction that uh, you are in a category with with morphisms, and there is a notion of dagger of the morphism, meaning that. You know, if I have R here, I could define R per by by the transpose of the of the relation, and in here I had I had this by defining the transpose. Which, by the way, if you have bases uh, and you have matrices expressing your linear maps, th these are just the transposes of, of the matrices, right? That's that's another way of saying that you have this sort of dual construction. Um, the idea is that this this operation uh, in this context really is. Um, really is uh, involutive in this way and you can you can check the behavior with composition uh, behaves precisely like you know you have r and s transpose you can check this is s transpose compose r transpose right so i'm just uh, tying one of your comments bernard to something that we uh, explain, explained earlier in just the context of algebra which is that whenever you have this this pattern you can actually now imagine that we are just in a dagger category category with a dagger Category, so you have composition and you have a dagger. Um, so you have X and Y two objects. You have a morphism F, a morphism G, and the morphism H. If I have a dagger, I can just take one of these these three morphisms and reverse it with a dagger. So this is G dagger, and of course this zigzag pattern that I go X to Y with F, then back to X with G dagger then uh, again to y with h uh, this is an operation that so so this is the in the home set for the objects x y i have this these three elements right f g h so, th so f g h belong to to that to that home set and the thing is i can define a ternary operation on the home set by doing f g h in the ternary bracket defined exactly like like we wrote earlier f composed with g dagger composed with h Right. So, so this is effectively the same construction. So, so that's that's what Bernard was was saying. So that's super interesting. The other uh, the other point that I want to um, elevate from what Bernard said is uh, the the part on intuition and vector spaces and, and, and geometry. I did mention at the very beginning that uh, you, you this intuition of uh, fine spaces um, can can be uh, can be captured uh, in in this higher higher ternary algebra um i'm, I'm now wondering is, is it bernard do you remember um I, I just did not think of the of the affine space uh, um, example but is it literally true that the that the quadrilateral completion operation is a semi-heap i don't know in general uh it's in any space it's true i at least in the plane, at least in the plane. I mean, at least in the plane. 
I, I, I will be honest, I, I didn't check that, so I, I, I okay, don't okay. say that it's, all, it's true. But uh, to, to see that, I, I'm sure that with heaps you can define a fine space. So I didn't look at the geometry and, you know, uh, filling this uh, point. But, uh, yeah, but I can for sure say that, that HIPS allows you to describe the fine uh, geometry in some nicer way, at least nicer to me with ternary operation. Right. But I, I would be very, very careful with. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I mean, I think I think this, uh, this we discussed actually also about a year ago in a seminar that we did in Edinburgh. Um, Mark Lawson was there and, and he, he was the one uh, making this claim so I, I was just wondering if you had seen the so this is uh, uh, I'm somehow just uh, pushing the, the the responsibility to someone else and not 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 just me claiming that, that this is the case but it it, it it does seem that is very likely the case because if you I mean um, if you take a if you take an origin somewhere you know you, you do I mean let, let me just you know, if I take an origin over here Oh. So I, I think it worked in Euclidean geometry according to the to the the thing that he mentioned. Of but, course, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, you... everything depends on your space, right? In Euclidean geometry, yeah, it should. It yeah, should I think work. I think it should because um, that vector over there is um, this vector plus this vector, right? So this vector yeah. is y minus x, and this vector is whatever z minus x right um or maybe z minus uh let's say z wait so that is meant to be well z minus x Z minus X, yeah, yeah. No, but I. It's not obvious. You need. Yeah, I. I this is not going to show it because the, the operation is on, is on points, and and this is the operation of vectors. So on vectors, you're going to have something like an abelian group um, but on points the claim here is that on points you get uh, a semi heap and that's kind of the uh, that's kind of the the play um, or in fact maybe a, even, even a heap because um, yeah anyway anyway uh, let's well, wouldn't you why would should be a middle point here right what do you mean a middle point? Uh, just swap X and Y, at least. X and Y? Yeah. What do you mean swap, like in... I don't know, you, you, you were trying to do... So that... your X minus Y plus Z is that point over there, right? No, no, so, 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 the, of... so this point, the quadrilateral suggests that that point is X minus... So, or y minus x plus uh, z minus x, mm -hmm. which, you know, it looks sort of similar, uh, but there's a, there's a factor of two here, right? Yeah. And, and, and x and y kind of swapped, if you really want to be more similar. That's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, 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 left. sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, that, but, that, but that's, I think that's the, the general idea. Um, that you get, you get this um, um, on points. Uh, th this, this would, if, if anyone is ever curious about this, we can, can always like follow up and, and actually um, construct. Because the, the, I think the interesting exercise is, um, Clearly, uh, quadrilateral co completion, the quadrilateral completion operation in, in an affine space is a ternary operation. That's a well-defined ternary operation. And the question is, you know, but using the axioms of affine spaces, what kind of algebra 
does it satisfy? Um, I think the, the, the claim was that it was a semi heap at least and quite possibly a heap with maybe even extra structure uh, that makes it into a into an affine space so it allows you to define a vector space out of it. Um, I think you, you can do such things like in geometric algebra easily. There's like a projective geometry representation in there when you can represent points as some kind of bivectors and there's natural operations to take a join and, and meets of those points to construct lines and the intersections, right? Like here, if you have just three points, you can easily construct two lines and you can uh, also, there's a special point there that represents infinity so we can translate it, right? So we can basically construct all of this, this point purely by geometric border. So maybe there's yeah. a parallel between this For projective sure. geometry in geometric algebra and this affine idea can be. Yes, uh, definitely. Yes, yes. Like what, what would be this triple product? What would it present in the geometric algebra? Yeah, I think the, the geometric algebra, the, the issue with geometric algebra is that it is usually defined on vector spaces and not affine spaces. Because I think here, what, what this is doing is the additive structure of vector spaces. This is why why it's a little bit subtle and why we're not, I prefer not to like delve into the, the specific details because what, what you're doing is normally you don't assign algebraic uh, behavior to space itself. Right? You assign the algebraic behavior to directions in space or paths in space or something like that, right? So that's the, the idea that your vector space, which is a model for infinitesimal paths or directions or, or, you know, or actual paths if they're straight or geodesic paths or whatever, like that inherits some algebraic structure, right? That's the usual perspective. I think the perspective of this sort of higher RET uh, affine geometry sort of approach is that you can sort of do away with having an algebra of a separate set of vectors by encoding this higher RET algebra on the points of a space itself. So I don't think there's a direct analog of in, in geometric algebra. Because geometric algebra, uh, in fact, I mean, there's not even a, a tensor, there's not even a, a inner product here yet, right? Like you don't, you don't need an inner product to, to do this, these constructions. Because the entire structure here is on the addition side of the, the linear algebra of geometric algebra. So I'm not so familiar with uh, with the projective geometry, and I'm sure that there is something because clearly, uh, fine geometry, and projective geometry, very intimately related. But I think geometric algebra, I mean, there is something relevant there to do, which is do what if you do geometric algebra having done this sort of heap version of addition. But if you think about the data that you have, it's just on the fact that you can add vectors that you're changing something in this approach. You're not changing anything. In, in, in the other sort of structures. And in fact, you're not even requiring that those structures are present. Um, so it really is just a matter of um, changing what you mean by uh, points in space or vectors. And, and you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's difficult to do a fine geometry without, I mean, if you want to do a fine geometry without vectors, you have to rely so, solely on, uh, on definitions of lines and things like that. Because all the all the machinery of of, um, of geometric algebra involves vector spaces. They involve sort of a, the associated vector space, the finite space, and and you know the construction of blades and higher multi vectors mm -hmm. and things like that. And but you know this is sort of like trying to not go there, to not not build a vector space, and basically tells you you can either build a vector space or live in a ternary algebra. And that's kind of a, a choice that you have. Uh, but yeah, uh, Richard, I don't know if you want to uh, make the, the question or comment uh, live. Sure, I, I don't know, it's perhaps risky. I was asking what a, what a tri-heap would look like, or is that just a, a stupid notion? <laughs> tri-heap? Have I, have I misunderstood something and that's why I'm asking a dumb question, or, or is there an extension beyond what, what you're doing to like the, the next level up? So it should be like tri-unit. And then yeah. uh, try unit. Um, so, I mean, there is certainly a, there's certainly a way to extend this. I mean, I'm wondering, is that connected to your previous comment? No, the previous one was also about, you know, at the beginning, you're, you're talking about how we sort of always map to an element, you know, 
of the sort of base set. So, oh, so like yeah. Sing- yeah, yeah. And I, I'm thinking a little bit, I mean, the motivation behind the question is things like reversible functions where you sort of, you, I mean, that's an example where you sort of stay within the same domain. So A cross A goes to A cross A and, and you have some information from which you can kind of recover and, and go backwards. For example, the fun- in reversible computing, you have like A plus B and A minus B are both returned. And so from from that information, you can always kind of go back. But I'm thinking also like, you know, A cross A cross A to A cross A or A cross A cross A to itself. It is, how, how does this whole story that you described here play out if you're no longer just going back to the, to the as I'm calling, base set, the, the single right the single object yeah so yeah th- this is a this is an interesting question i mean um it really depends on um okay so there's something yeah oh, it's unrelated. yeah yeah no sorry, sorry i'll just uh so um the more uh the most general setting where you can where you can go to to investigate these things is uh poly categories the, the notion of poly, t- poly categories, I mean, that, that, but that's basically like saying, you know, you go to many to many functions and, and you have that notion of essentially string dry- diagrams where you can, you know, partially uh, splice uh, in- inputs and outputs and you get, you know, from poly functions to poly functions, like many to many, from many to many, pairs of many to many to many to many. So um, that's what I would say is the natural that's the natural uh, formalism, sort of where, where those things in, are are based. Now, my my claim would be that we have a terrible understanding of the general uh, structure of those things. If we compare our understanding to things like groups or semi-groups or you know these these much more concentrated algebras, of course, um, you can always think of the problem of factorization in some sense or the problem of um, separability in a way where this uh, many to many functions are actually some kind of direct product of many to one functions uh, uh, and again this is just a sort of an analog of other other sort of tensor product like uh, constructions but um, so it's not that you can you, you arrive at that land completely uh, uh, sort of unarmed with, with, with tools to, to make progress but but it, it is a much wilder land, and I would say it's the land of you know tensor networks and things like that. I mean, the, all those formalisms I think are making much uh, much more headway. Now, one example of something that has much much a much more uh, algebraic flavor, and that I've I've explored myself um, uh, a little bit in connection to these higher order hierarchy structures, is something called hyper uh, hyper structures hyper or, or hyper algebra, some people call them hyper algebras. And this hyper here doesn't really relate to hypergraphs. It relates to, or perhaps the most historical notion of hypergraph only. Um, so these are algebras where you take values on the power set. Instead of the set itself, you take values on the power set. Um, so yeah, in some sense, uh, you could have the power set or you could have the, the sort of uh, Cartesian pr- uh, powers, right? So you could have the power set or the Cartesian power, uh, and 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 you know, in this you you have some some ways of taking some elements of your set and getting some elements out, right? Um, so so yeah, the moment you the moment you um, depart from the sort of operatic regime, by operatic I mean you have many to one, right? Like you you, you have this very general many to one, which uh, operats sort of encapsulate. Um, you're getting yourself into the territory of something that looks like a much more like a network. It looks much more like stream, stream diagrams and, and things like that, and, and you know flow diagrams and, and things like that. So, so yeah. So I think those. So you lose some of the power of, of algebraic reasoning in those in those settings, and I think in those settings, uh, sort of hypergraph rewriting uh, becomes or, or graph rewriting you know becomes much more the the tool to go uh, with, um, but yeah. Anyway, I'm just sort of like uh, commenting on, on on the possibility. Um, yeah, thank you. And then, well, the question about tri heaps. Um, 
That's interesting because, so, okay, so the, the immediate answer is if you are in a, if you're in a, something like a semi heap, um, the notion of a tri unit doesn't fully make sense uh, uh, in a way because uh, a unit is a, is an element that has a, that's, that has compositional behavior, meaning it is, it is related to other elements in a generic way. It's not, it's not that you identify. So it's a property of an element. It's not a property of, of the operation. So then if you involve three elements simultaneously so that you're calling something try uh, uh, for, for three elements, um, you're already filling up the entire, the entire operation. So you would basically constrain to uh, sort of try units will effectively be just set subsets of elements that give some symmetry to your operation uh, i mean that that would be my my uh, most charitable interpretation of something that would be called a tri unit in some sense which is you know you have to relate a ternary product of three elements to a to something else so that could either be um well okay perhaps it could be one of the three elements that's that's i guess a possibility uh but no but actually if it's one of the three elements you actually end up with the notion of bi unit because that's exactly the equation of a bi unit, and and so you you the only thing that you can relate it to is another operation of the three elements in the same of uh, another another outcome of the th of the same operation of the three of the three elements, and so that ends up being a permutation of the of the three elements. So th so that's the most charitable interpretation in a ternary algebra. But of course, if you're in a quaternary algebra, then then a tri unit makes perfect sense, uh, and and then you know it it's only. I guess natural to. Uh, it's funny how I've spent like about a year and a half with uh, heaps and semi heaps, and I have never thought about what is the quaternary generalization of, of semi heaps. Um, I, I wonder. Yeah, I wonder. There, there exists and they are described somewhere. I mean, it's universal algebra study all of them, but I know that for quaternary they have some kind of geometric interpretation. I don't remember what is the interpretation, but I know that quaternary operations were studied somewhere. But uh, the do you mean quaternary operations in general, or do you mean quaternary generalizations of heaps? I mean a quaternary generalization of heap. I, I'm not sure if it's exactly a generalization of heap, but I know it's quaternary operation with some very natural uh, axioms. Right, 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 right. yes. Probably some kind of associativity and something else to, yeah. to feed. Sure. Yeah. No, that's 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 uh, that's a good point. There, there, there are natural quaternary operations. Um, yeah. So, anyway. Um, yeah. But I don't know what is exactly the the interpretation right now. Yeah, these are some interesting uh, thematic stacks stack change. Trying to find a quaternary bracket. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, triple product. Yeah, that's it. That's the usual triple product. Um, and then algebra is the Turner law. This paper, I probably know. Uh, oh, of course, yeah, the Abramov. Yeah, yeah. So, so yes, so that actually that paper, I'll just put it in the chat for everyone's benefit. And th this is this is just for my personal historical, uh, a personal historical note. So this was the paper that. Um, actually got me into semi heaps to begin with because uh, that that's a paper where I mean it, there's a there's a computer search for a possible so the computer cubic matrices um, had been studied for a while since whatever the early nineties or whatever this is the two thousand nine paper and um, so there there were 
defining products left, right, and center, you know, saying, okay, you can contract these three indices in these different ways and, you know, doing all kinds of checks and, and, and coming up with speculations of, oh, could we, could this be the key to uh, chromodynamics because there's some ternariness about it? Can we find some kind of classical Heisenberg algebra, ternary Heisenberg algebra, so that, blah, blah, blah. So, um, in the end, uh, what it, what it led to was to some investigations on just cubic matrix operations. Um, and uh, so someone, I mean, there's a Abram of uh, collaboration, uh, they co probably got fed up with just fiddling with the axioms and said, well, what axioms do we care about? Which basically translates to what axioms do we know or have we seen before in print? And they said associativity, like literally, um, no, just right here, if my operation satisfies, my ternary operation satisfies something like this, C, D, E equals, and then, and then you can move the bracket around, B, C, D, E equals A, B, C, D, E. And the other thing that they knew from, from being, from existing in print was precisely semi-heaps. So the other axiom is, you know, you write the same here, you write the same here, and, but here you swap crucially B and D in the expression. Um, so they call this associativity one, very sterile associativity two. And they said, that's about it. <laughs> We're not gonna look into more axioms because we, we don't know more. There's no more, you know, you read the paper, you really get the feeling that the, the, there's some deep reason why there shouldn't be more axioms in this because the, you know, they, they are presented like there's nothing else. <laughs> right and it, obviously it is not argued that there's nothing else because there's no argument to to dismiss any other axioms but there's certainly no no comment on and we only consider this because blah 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 i mean they basically just write the paper in such a way that you get the feeling that this is everything that you could ever ask for um and and so they go on and they do a computer search they take matrices of size i think two by two by two and three by three by three or something like that and they uh computationally search for all the possible um, all the possible definitions of contractions of indices, right? And uh, and they they scan, you know, if you have something like sum sum indices of a index 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 b index 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 c index index index, so that by the end of the contraction you end up with something, you know, uh, whatever call it capital A with index in the index, right? So all the possible ways in which you can do this, you know, like tracing out some indices or like summing together some pairs of indices or three or something, like they, they checked for all of them and they found that the only one that they, they the, the, so they found that only one contraction actually satisfied one of those two axioms. Actually four contractions, but they are all diagrammatically equivalent. Um, the, and, 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 the, and it is this contra this uh, contraction, so the, the PQR, you do A, so the, the product is, let me call it product IJK, so this is going to be some output cubic matrix that is uh, constructed from IJP times B uh, PQ, sorry, QRP times C QRJ. So for some reason I've lost my, oh no, it's here. So I, I'm gonna highlight the outer indices for each of, so I, J, K, right? And this is I, J, K, I, J, K. So these are the kinds of things they, they, they checked um, for all the possible combinatorial, uh, so for, for, for all the possible combinations of, of contractions. Uh, and they were scanning whether these operations satisfied those products computationally, right? They found that none of them satisfied A1 and the yellow one satisfied A2. So to me, the most relevant result there is none of them satisfied A1. That is really interesting uh, already. Um, meaning somehow cubic matrices don't know about associativity anymore because you know, there's no way to contract them together so that they are associative in that literal sense. And this one here is a very old friend of ours uh, because this is, of course, the fish product. Um, if you represent your if you represent your matrices as triangles with um, with uh, vertices for indices, 
uh, then this this you can represent like a fish, basically. Um, so you have, sir. You have the fish structure. You have I J K. I J K, and then you have P Q R. P Q R. You have A B C like that. Um, so it's actually uh, a bit deceiving to to be uh, to be uh, calling this a proper fish product because um, I mean it diagrammatically makes sense but actually when you look at the structure of the matrices you see that you can group um, you can group the indices in pairs right so you can see your cubic matrix i j k you can see it simply as a, a multi-index i j and then k so call those multi-indices you know uh, a and m some, somehow and then you can just group the multi-index uh, qr in the expression above and the product can be rewritten here simply as sum over mn of a um, sorry let me call this capital p capital r for example you call this m capital p times b uh, capital R, capital P, times C, capital R, and then N, for example. So, so this, uh, that just looks like matrices, and then when you realize that you have B multiplied with, you know, summing over the, in the same index on both positions, so that just means that I'm taking a transpose, so if I transpose B in the middle, sorry, P, so it should be R, P. So I take a transpose of that, so I have actual equality. Then, lo and behold, we're in the situation as before. This is basically sort of, uh, you know, A times B transpose times C, which is the structure that we saw before that we obviously gonna end up with a, with a semi-heap structure. Um, so, what I find interesting in this paper, uh, this, this Abramov uh, paper, is that, um, I mean, basically they found, the, they found the, the fish because they should have, because you can, it's a fact of just the cardinality of, of cubic matrices that you can separate indices in two and one, right? So when you do that, when you separate two, three indices into two and one, you consider one of the two as a multi-index, then effectively your, your ternary matrices become ordinary matrices uh, and 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 so because they are ordinary matrices you can compose them then the fish diagram in disguise becomes the zigzag diagram because that you know ij whatever ver vertical you know if i choose some color you know whatever 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 is happening in the vertical directions here right um i just re rename so i just make a single I make a single vertex for the vertical directions, so but I keep the other vertices the same, right? I have this kind of diagram. So A is a matrix that is pointing in that direction. B is a matrix that I have to transpose because it's actually pointing in this direction. Uh, sorry, in the other direction. And C is going in that direction. So A, B, C look like this in the diagram. Uh, a lot of lag in the tablet right now. So, um, of course, if you just transpose B, then you change the orientation here, and you can just simply compose a uh, diagram like like relations or matrices. And so, of course, you get the composition to be just A compose B transpose compose C. Um, so no surprises there. Right? Like the, the, there is really no no. So in in some sense. This paper will claim that they found something, that that's their fi the, the final conclusion of the paper is we found something, we found this. In fact, they, they, would, they, they wrote four different uh, versions of that because then you can contract, you know, you can group them into different ways and you can swap the indices and things still work. Um, but effectively, they are all contracting the same structure. Um, uh, and they satisfy all the same action. They say, oh, we found this and, you know, the, it's kind of, I mean, it is technically true they found it, but in, in a way, mathematically, there's no content there, in a way, because uh, 
all you all you all you find is that yes, technically you can do uh, two plus one, sort of the composition of a set of of three elements, and then you can regard them as multi indices, and as multi indices you can just regard them as ordinary matrices, and if you get three ordinary matrices, there is a natural way in which you can do a ternary composition with them, which is uh, which is that one. I guess what's interesting is that the same is not true for uh, um, for the same is not true for the, the associative triple composition it, because if you have three binary matrices uh, uh, square matrices you can obviously just do a, a b c and that's an associative operation now the reason why that doesn't work is that um, you generally don't have the the conformality conditions so, so, so you can't you can't just write down a M P uh, P R R N, right? So, so that combination of indices um, it can only be formed when when your matrices are cubic or square, right? So, so you know that's not a general uh, it's not a general construction. You can do that. that's why they didn't find it. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's um, it's kind of a callback to how everything started for me. Um, for those in the Wolfram sphere might be familiar with Cersei's. Uh, we had a conversation over that paper and I was looking at the paper with the expression they had and it's like, wait, I can draw this diagram. I drew a fish and it's like, ah, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And I understand why this should work. And then later on, I've understood much, uh, much uh, transparently that it is actually just the fact that you can group indices and it's, it's a zigzag construction like we discussed in the other context. But yeah, anyway, um, this has gone uh, for uh, probably way too long for, uh, that is uh, advisable for uh, for an algebra an algebra live stream. But um, yeah, I wonder what uh, happened to uh, Jonathan. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, if there are any questions or comments uh, with people in the audience, uh, you can follow to follow us up on our community. So I'll leave the link here. Uh, Bernard, any final comments or or? No, cool. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was uh, really great. Thanks for uh, thanks for the comments, guys, and um, I'll see everyone in our next live stream. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Bye.